There we go. Are we on? That's better. Gee. So anyway, it's, uh, it's lovely to be able to come here to share the word of God. Saints from Village Church bring greetings to you. Um, when Nelson first gave me an invitation to come and share the word, you obviously do the smart thing and you get online and see what sort of services are run there. So I had a look at the, the YouTube site and it was quite interesting that there was a, a message there entitled a short sermon by Nelson Atwood that lasted for 40 minutes. So <laughs> I thought, well, if that's the case, then I know tonight's going to be, at least it's going to be a short sermon. I didn't find anything on there called a long sermon. So I don't have any real uh, gauge to know how to go by, but it kind of gets to my point about what I want to share on tonight. There's so many places, uh, so many churches where we hear a same cry. The sermon goes too long. The sermon goes too long. It really does show a, um, I'm trying to think of a nice word, but a, a neglect uh, for the word of God. And that's what I want to come and and talk to you tonight about is the Word of God. I know that you guys are a Bible-believing church, and if I said, would you raise your hand if you believe in the Bible, I'm sure every hand would go up. But there seems to be a, a disconnect in what we see in the Christian church. Many people say that they believe in it, but we have to admit that we live in the most biblically illiterate time in church history. We say we believe in the Bible and yet we sometimes are more interested in what's going on on TV. We're more interested in the latest Netflix series than we are in the Word of God. And, and I believe that the biggest challenge one of the biggest issues we face today is our view on the word of God and the value that it has in our lives well, I'd like to read out a, uh, a short quote if I can just to illustrate the point it's an article from Al Mohler entitled the scandal of biblical illiteracy he goes to say, quote, fewer than half of all adults can name the four Gospels. Many Christians cannot identify more than two or three of the disciples. According to the data from the Barna Research Group, 60% of Americans can't even name five of the Ten Commandments. No wonder people break the Ten Commandments all the time. They don't know what they are, said George Barner, president of the firm. The bottom line, increasingly, America is biblically illiterate. Goes on to say, multiple surveys reveal the problem in stark terms. According to 82% of the Americans, God helps those who help themselves is a Bible verse. Those identified again as born-again Christians did better by 1%. So in other words, 81% of born-again Christians believe that God helps those who help themselves is a Bible verse. A majority of adults think the Bible teaches that the most important purpose in life is taking care of one's family. Now, while that may be an honourable pursuit... It's not the most important purpose in life. Some of the statistics are enough to perplex even those aware of the problem. A Barna poll indicated that at least 12% of adults believed that Joan of Arc was Noah's wife. Another survey of graduating high school seniors revealed that over 50% thought that Sodom and Gomorrah were husband and wife. A considerable number of respondents to one poll indicated that the Sermon of the Mount was preached by Billy Graham. We are in big trouble, end quote. 
and the response that I just heard then of laughter and amusement, although we find those some of those things are, and we, we laugh at it, I get that. Can I read another quote for you? This is from the State of the Bible survey in 2022. First, we noticed an unprecedented drop in the percentage of Bible users. Their definition of a Bible user is one who read the Bible at least three to four times each year. So the bar is very low, okay? In every study since 2018, Bible users have accounted for between 47 and 49% of American adults. However, the 2022 data showed a 10% decrease from the same time in 2021. Okay, 10% drop. What does this mean? This means that nearly 26 million Americans reduced or stopped their interaction with scripture in the past year. It's almost as if everyone in Australia was reading the Bible and stopped. I hope that shocks you. And I know this is stats and it's a numbers game and I get that. But every bit of research, every survey is showing the same trend and it is a downward trend. And I hope this, tonight you can see we have a problem and we can't think, well, that's them. That's not going to happen to us. Do you remember in the Old Testament, in the book of 2 Kings, do you remember Josiah? Do you remember his reform? Young Josiah becomes the king and what does he do? He wants to reform the land. So what does he start off doing? Let's go in there. Let's build, rebuild and repair the temple. What does he do? He sends his secretary to go and get some money from the temple so they can start repairing the temple and get things back. In 2 Kings 22 verse 8, it says, And Hilkiah the high priest said to Shaphan the secretary, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. Do you get that? They found the word of God in the house of God. Is that one of the saddest Bible verses you have ever heard in your life? They found the word of God in the house of God. Everything was happening. They had temple worship going on. Temple worship was still going on. They were carrying out their services just like every other day. But they were missing the word of God. And we may think that's never going to happen to us. But I can guarantee you, I'm sure the Israelites would have said exactly the same thing prior to that. And today, today, all across this state, all across this country, across the earth, there have been services going on that have been totally void of the word of God. They would have had some great worship times and they may have had some talks about Ethics, throw in a bit of pop psychology in there, but they would not have opened up the word of God. There would be no preaching of the gospel. There would be no mention of sin, of repentance, and of the cross of Christ. 
there was no whole counsel of God, beloved. That's the bad news. Now we can get on to the good news. And while things may appear grim, there is hope, of course. And that hope is found in the word of God. And I believe the answer to all of this is we simply have to answer the issue and realise what sort of book it is that we have that is a book like no other book. We need to understand its nature. We need to understand its purpose. Nelson has already read our, our passage. We really, tonight, I, I want to vo- focus really just on verses 16 and 17 of Second Timothy I may just read or reread um, 2 Timothy, starting from chapter 3, and I'll start just from verse 10, just to reacquaint ourselves with that. You, however, have followed my teaching and my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness, my persecutions, and sufferings that happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, and at Lystra, which persecutions I endured. Yet from all them the Lord rescued me. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. While evil people and imposters will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you have learned it and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped, for every good work. Let's just bow our heads, can we, and pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can be here tonight. We thank you for your word. Your word is truth. Your word is life. Father, I pray tonight as I share your word to these precious saints, Help me to speak well. Help me to speak with clarity. Lord, it is your word. I need your Holy Spirit. They don't need to hear from a man. They need to hear from you tonight. So help me to share your word as you would see fit. And Lord, it is to you all glory and all praise and all honour is due. And it is in Jesus' matchless name we pray. Amen. Well, as I mentioned, the way for us to avoid becoming another statistic is to realise what sort of a, a book it is that we have and for us to abide in it. And I want to look tonight at three characteristics of the Bible that it is inspired, that it is useful, and that it is equipping. So by way of a bit of background, Second Timothy is uh, Paul's last letter that he wrote. He wrote it to his son in the faith, Timothy, to encourage him, for him to continue in the faith, to hold on to sound doctrine, and to put his confidence in the word and to preach it relentlessly. This is Paul's last will and testament. And I guess if you think of any last will and testament, if you were writing one out, you would write the, the, the very things that are so dear on your heart. You would write the things that are, you want to get out that those who are going to receive that will hear. Anything that Paul is writing here is to encourage Timothy to stir him up, 
and Paul's charge in light of the coming difficult days as we, we read earlier in the beginning of chapter 3. Those charges to Timothy to continue to remain steadfast in the word of God. Paul's telling Timothy to stay the course, to not be creative, to not give way to the cultural trends, to not give way to the dictates of man, to not look at this book as unfashioned, out of touch. And it's the same charge to us this evening. We need to continue in what we have learned and firmly believed. Paul here is passing on the mantle to Timothy and in verses 16 and 17, it's reminding him that as he resists those false apostles or the false opponents of the gospel, it's scripture that will equip him for the task. So the first characteristic that we see is that scripture is inspired or it's God breathed. First thing that Paul wants to remind Timothy that all scripture is breathed out by God. All scripture, all scripture, not only the Old Testament, which is what Paul would have been referring to at the time, but all scripture, New Testament as well, all 66 books of the Bible are inspired. They are all God-breathed, all of it. It is God-breathed also, we see, we have to ask what is this book? Is it just a book that's written by men, as some people would claim? Or is it something else? And this speaks to the authority of Scripture. Because the Bible is God-breathed, because it is the very Word of God, then we need to take notice. If it wasn't inspired, then there would be no source of absolute truth. There would be no source of authority. But, beloved, we have a Bible here. We have the words of God. The question of the authority of the word of God isn't just some academic or scholarly debate. And until we decide what the answer to this question is, we are going to be tossed around to and fro. John Kelvin wrote that we cannot rely on the doctrine of Scripture until we are absolutely convinced that God is its author. And this verse, more than any other, speaks to the issue of that. It tells us its source. Bible Believers Commentary says, this is one of the most important verses in the Bible on the subject of inspiration. It teaches that the scriptures are God-breathed. And in a miraculous way, he communicated his word to men and led them to write it down for a permanent preservation. And what they wrote was the very word of God, inspired and infallible. And while it's true that the individual literary style of the writer was not destroyed, it is also true that the very words he used here were the words given to him here by the Holy Spirit. B.B. Warfield puts it way more succinctly. He just says that the Bible is the word of God in such a way that when the Bible speaks, God speaks. But not only Paul believed this, but Peter also believed this as well, didn't he? In 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 20 and 21, he says, Knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but when men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Every book, every paragraph, every sentence, every word is inspired by God. It's one cohesive story that tells of God's redeeming work through Christ Jesus. And because it is God's word, we need to be careful how we handle it. I don't know if you remember the Jesus Seminar. The Jesus Seminar went back to 1985. A group of 50 biblical scholars and 100 laymen 
got together with the brilliant idea that they would look through the Gospels and determine which of Jesus' sayings he really said. And they did this by means of getting some beads, different coloured beads, and they would give each coloured bead a, a score. And they would look through the writings of Jesus and they would throw a red bead down if they believed that that was something that Jesus said. Maybe a pink bead if they said, well, we're not too sure, but it probably could have been something that Jesus said. Then they'd give it a grey bead if they thought, well, it's not something that Jesus said, but he could have said something like that. It sort of has the, the same sort of feeling that Jesus might say. And then they might cast a black bead if they thought, no, Jesus would never have said that. This went on for 20 years. They could have saved themselves a lot of, lot of time if they had just read 2 Timothy 3.16, couldn't they? All scripture is God-breathed. The problem is, even though the Jesus seminar does not exist, it's still going on today, isn't it? That mindset happens every time people just cherry pick verses out of the Bible to make a sermon out of it because it suits their text. No, we don't stand over scripture. We submit to the scripture. I was going to use a quote from the Westminster Confession, but being you know, Baptist, uh, you know, I'll go from the Second London, which I believe they stole from the Westminster Confession anyway, but that's, that's a topic for another day. The London Baptist Confession states it well. It says, the authority of the Holy Scripture for which it ought to be believed depends not upon the testimony of any man or church, but wholly upon God, who is truth itself, the author thereof. Therefore, it is to be, be received because it is the word of God. So, our second point, scripture is profitable. Second thing, that Paul wants to remind Timothy is that all scripture is profitable. And this text, 3.16 and 17, this is the watershed text when we look at theology, systematic theology and bibliology. But I don't believe Paul is trying to convince Timothy here about the source of scripture. Timothy had known that all his life we read that, didn't we, in verse 14? But as for you, continue in what you have learned and firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. I think rather Paul is applying what the implications of inspiration are. Because the scripture's source is from God, a consequence of that is all of it is profitable. And what is profitable? It just means to benefit, to gain advantage, to be useful. So Paul is reminding Timothy that all scripture is profitable. It is for our gain. It is for our advantage. Similar concept we see in 1 Timothy 4 8 when it says, For while bodily training is of some value, that's the word there, profitable value, godliness is of value in every way as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. So you can go to gym, you can do your workouts, you can pump the weights. You can come home, you can knock down some chicken and broccoli and brown rice, put down a protein shake afterwards. That is profitable for you, for your body. But Paul is saying the word of God is much 
more profitable in every way. So we don't get caught up in other things. We don't get caught up in other things. We are to preach the word. That was Paul's charge to Timothy, wasn't it? Preach the word. And because scripture is profitable, that's why we do what we do, isn't it? It's why we do what we do, because scripture is profitable, because we believe that. It's why we don't show movies on a Sunday morning. It's why we don't do skits in do art painting or any of these other things. We preach the word because it's profitable. I like the old guys, like the, the old guys, the reformers, the Puritans. Do you know, before the Reformation, you would go into a church service. You would turn up. There would be someone there. And if you were just a day-to-day worker, you would turn up. They would be talking in Latin, in a language you would not understand. They probably had their back to you because they're facing an altar. So you would be there, not understand anything and go away. But then came the Reformation. That changed everything. And the word of God started to be translated into other languages, language people could understand, their own common language. The printing press became available, so now Bibles are being distributed out. They're getting into the hands of people. And churches are being built. And it's interesting, as the churches were being built... They took the pulpit and they raised it up. And many people would have to go through their little spiral staircase to get into the pulpit. And there was a gate on a lot of them and they would close that gate and lock themselves in because they were there to do business. They were there to preach the word of God. And that pulpit was elevated, not because the preacher wanted people to see him. It didn't get raised because I needed to amplify my voice because they didn't have a killer sound system. It was raised because that's their view of scripture. It was raised because they had a high view of scripture it's about the word because the word is profitable Joshua 1 8 says keep this book of the law always on your lips meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it then you will be prosperous and successful All scripture is profitable. Leviticus. Yes, Leviticus. Chronicles. Those first nine chapters of just genealogies. It's all profitable because it's God's word. It speaks to us. It's profitable It's a mind for us to just keep pulling out treasures and treasures and treasures and you can just keep mining that for the rest of your life. R.C. Sproul. In the way only R.C. Sproul could do it and I can't do an R.C. Sproul growl and grit but R.C. Sproul said, I think the greatest weakness in the church today is that almost no one believes that God 
invests his power in the Bible. Everyone is looking for a power in a program, in a methodology, in a technique, in anything and everything but that in which God has placed it, his word. He alone has the power to change lives for eternity and that power is focused on the scriptures, end quote. Paul then goes to tell, on to tell Timothy the four ways in which scripture is profitable, that is teaching, reproof, correction, training in righteousness. Or if that's too hard, what's right, what's wrong, how to get right and how to stay right. The first two speak about what we believe, the last two about how we live. So scripture is profitable for teaching. Scripture is intended to instruct or intended to teach. God desires to take his holy inspired word and instruct us to renew our minds, clarifying our wrong thinking and to replace lies and half-truth with God's truth. In all of this is transforming us more and more into the image of his dear son. Psalm 119 in verses 97 to 105 says, Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. Your commandment makes me wiser than my enemies, for it is ever with me. I have more understanding than all my teachers, for your testimonies are my meditation. I understand more than the aged, for I keep your precepts. I hold back my feet from every evil way in order to keep your word. I do not turn aside from your rules, for you have taught me how sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than the honey to my mouth. And through your precepts, I get understanding. Therefore, I hate every false way. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Did you hear that? His commandments make us wise. His commandments give us understanding. So it is profitable for teaching. It is profitable for reproof. And the goal of reproof is to convict or bring a person to the point of recognising wrongdoing. To convince, to convict them of their sins. It includes the idea of rebuke which compels one to see their fault and to admit their error. Hebrews 4, 12 to 13 says, For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and the intents of the heart. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him, to whom we must give an account. That's the word of God. You know, we sometimes think of that two-edged sword as this very big, massive two-handed sword. But I don't think that's what the, the text really says. When we look at the Greek, that word there can often mean just a, a short dagger. Some Greek texts refer to it as even smaller still, a scalpel. And that's the word of God, isn't it? It's the word of God that is so precise that can penetrate into the deepest depths. It doesn't bludgeon us. Sometimes it does, but it's more that it can get in like a surgeon, skilled surgeon with that scalpel can just make the proper cuts in the proper places. The word of God does that. No other book, beloved, can do that. There is no other book that can, has ever, ever been able to have the effect on me that this book has had. You can read many, many texts, but only this book has done a work in my life that this book can, has accomplished. No other book. Proverbs 12 verse 1 says, Whoever loves discipline loves knowledge, but he who hates reproof is stupid. 
Don't be stupid. Don't be stupid. God's word is here to reprove you. It's a good thing when it does that. It's a good thing when the word of God comes in and convicts you. It's a good thing when the word of God shows you that what you are doing is wrong. If we don't know the Bible, we can't be shaped by it. The fourth thing is that it's profitable for correction. This literally means just straightening up again and restoring something back to its original and proper condition. It has the suggestion of improvement of life and character. And if reproof shows us where we're crooked, correction shows us how to get straight. The light of God's word enables one to correct or set straight that which is broken. It has that concept of taking a, a broken bone and setting it right, setting it proper. Psalm 119 again, verses 9 to 11 says, How can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to your word. With my whole heart I seek you. Let me not wander from your commandments. I have stored up your word in my heart that I may not sin against you. And as we store up God's word in our hearts, it has that sanctifying effect in our lives. Paul's last statement about profitability says that it is profitable for the training in righteousness. Finally, in this list, Paul says that scriptures are profitable for training in righteousness. And that original meaning of training had to do with the bringing up and training of children. It was about providing instruction with the intent of forming proper habits of behaviour, of providing guidance of responsible living or rearing and guiding of a child towards maturity. It's the same thing we see in Ephesians 6 verses, sorry, Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 4. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the, the Lord. That word discipline again is the, is the same word. And it wasn't just teaching, but rather training. There's that concept, isn't there, of 10,000 hours. You've got to do 10,000 hours to be get skilled in something. Play the guitar. Um, and there's a, a saying amongst guitarists You've got to get into the woodshed. And for the longest time, I did not understand why you needed to get into the woodshed. What is the big deal with the woodshed? What if you don't own a woodshed? What do you do then? Can you never proceed as a guitarist? But the woodshed is really just a way for guitarists and musos to say, get out there, practice your chops, hence the woodshed. So, but what we need to do is we just got to train. That's the saying with, you just got to get out there. You've got to invest time, really. You have to invest time in any skill that you want to pick up. But the word of God is even more important. And if we want to learn it, but beyond that, if we want to let it have its effect in our life, we have to spend time and time and time. We have to spend those hours in the woodshed. The same, we've got to just spend time and invest in the word of God. Training involves the action of teaching a person to acquire a particular skill or a type of behaviour. And the scriptures are designed to train us in godly thinking and godly living. Our training is to build us up to be mature men and women of God. And the Bible is the only place where we can find all of his commandments. It's the only place that teaches us how to walk right before God. So if God's word is profitable, then we need to invest 
you need to invest in the word. I'm not into shares or into the stock market. I mean, you can watch the news at night time, can't you? And you, 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 it's going, one day it's going up, the next day it's going down. But I wonder, you know, imagine if someone came to you back late 80s, whatever it was, 90s, and says, I've got a company, little company at the moment. It's called Apple. Um, who would, would you like to invest in it? We make this thing called the, the computer. It's, you know, it's pretty niche. You know, we think it might take off. You'd probably go, it sounds sketchy. I am not going to spend a cent on that. Microsoft, the same thing. No, sketchy. I'm not a personal computer. That, that, that's never going to take off. The word of God is not like these things. The word of God is a sure investment. When you invest into it, it will pay back dividends beyond your wildest dreams, beloved. And the beauty of the word of God is you can just be withdrawing any time you want from it. You can withdraw as much as you want and you will never lose. It is the best investment you will ever put your life and time into. So, our third point is that scripture is equipping. Why? In verse 17, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. This is the purpose of scripture, that we become complete, that we become equipped. Paul's telling Timothy that the man of of God with the word of God will be effective for God's work. The man of God with the word of God will be effective for God's work. And here this speaks really to the sufficiency of scripture is we don't need anything else. And that man of God is really a technical term there for a preacher. We see that back in 1 Timothy in chapter 6. But by application tonight, it speaks to all of us, doesn't it? To every born-again believer, each one of us, individually, corporately. Man of God may be complete. That word complete means being able to meet the required expectations. It means capable, proficient. And to be equipped is to be furnished perfectly to be complete for a special purpose, prop properly fitted because all parts work together, not lacking anything for every good work, all that God is calling us to do, the doing of life, to fulfil the great commission of Christ. Scripture needs to be the thing that shapes us. Scripture and only Scripture, only the Word of God will make me a better husband. Only Scripture will make me a better brother in Christ. Only scripture, only the word of God will make me a better neighbour, a better worker, a better person. There simply is there is no other choice. You can neglect that at your own peril. But I pray you would never do that. Peter, in John chapter 6, in verses 66, to 68 
It says, after this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. So Jesus said to the twelve, do you want to go your way as well? And Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And beloved in Christ, this is the same message to us tonight. Whom else can we go to? My hope, my prayer is that you will continue to be people of the word. To abide in the word and not in anything else. You could choose to ignore that if you want, like I said, at your own peril. And even if you choose to ignore that, you might just cruise through the rest of this life and that'll be fine. But can I ask you, what about the next generation? If you do not want to be one of those statistics which we heard earlier, what about the next generation? Because if those statistics and those trends keep happening at this rate, we need to give that some serious thought and we need to give that some serious prayer. God has blessed us with his word as the primary means that he uses to change us into the likeness of Christ. And this isn't just about information. This is about transformation. We're meant to be disciples of Christ. A disciple was a disciplined one. We don't have the option just to do whatever we want. We are his slaves. We are his bond servants. We're ambassadors of Christ, aren't we? An ambassador is meant to know their sovereign's message and this is his message. A.W. Tozer said, The Bible is not an end in itself, but a means to bring men to an intimate and satisfying knowledge of God, that they may enter into him, that they may delight in his presence, may taste and know the inner sweetness of the very God himself in the core and centre of their very hearts. Let us taste and see that the Lord is good from his word. I'd just like to finish by reading one last scripture. And if you remember nothing else, I pray you would keep this with you. Psalm 19, verses 7 to 11. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. 
Moreover, by them your servant is warned, and in keeping them is great reward. Let us pray. O oh Lord and our God, we thank you for your word. your precious word, that instrument you've chosen to declare your truth. Father, it is my prayer that we will always be people of your word. Whatever pressures, whatever things come upon us, we will cling and we will hold to your word. We thank you for it. We thank you it is that means that you have given to change us and transform us more and more into the image of your dear son. So Father, we do praise you for it. Help us to hold fast. Help us to fight the good fight. And Lord, help us to be ambassadors. Help us to proclaim your word to a lost and dying generation, for they so need it. Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for your great grace. We pray all of these things, Lord, in the matchless name of Christ Jesus, our Lord, our Saviour, our God and our King, and all the people of God said, Amen. Thank you so very much for me sitting back there. Uh, some of you will understand this, some may not. A couple of you asked me, what does Uncle Jack look like? Uncle Jack, you say, the guy that taught me to study. Not one of you ever asked me, what does Uncle Jack sound like? Am I, am I right? Uh, 28 years ago, I sat in the basement of Quilchina Chapel where we were, we were attending when we were first married and sat there in that room and this, don't be offended, elderly gentleman walked up to the pulpit and in a very similar tone of voice talked and preached the word of God just like you did. And afterwards, he invited me to study with him and that was Uncle Jack. So I can only speak for myself when I say for a tremendous hour of encouragement from my soul in the tone of voice of the man that invested in me to teach me to study and encourage me, I can just say thank you. And I, I sure hope you were listening tonight. I know many of you were. I couldn't, add, I, I, I'm Baptist, I have to keep my amens to a dull roar, but I, I'm telling you, I wanted to do a Pentecostal amen halfway through and blow the doors off, because he's, what he was saying is absolutely true. So I want to close with a benediction. It comes from Romans 16, that goes like this. Now to him who is able to establish you, according to my gospel, and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery which has been kept secret for long ages past, but now has been disclosed through the scriptures of the prophets in accordance with the commandment of the eternal God, has been made known to all nations, leading to obedience of faith to the only wise God through Jesus Christ be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. God bless you all. We're finished.